We love expository preaching here, and so we're continuing in Romans 12 today. And so if you've got a Bible, turn it on and scroll to Romans 12, verse 14. Um, you old school folks can turn your pages to Romans 12, 14. We don't care what you do, um, as long as you can get there. If you don't have a Bible or an app or anything like that, we'll hopefully have it on the screen for you, assuming technology cooperates, and um, you guys can follow right along that way. Um, I am rocking the prototype of the shirt. Um, our new shirt design, and so if you, I know I look good, I'm like modeling this today, so if you guys want one of these, um, if, if you've never received a free t-shirt from our church, it is our gift to you, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to order, you don't have to do nothing like that, just make sure to be here next week, and we will have them here, ready for you, we're going to have tons of shirts here, if you have received one of those black, cool ones, um, and you already got one of those, what we're asking is that you just buy one of these, and so newheightswv.com slash t-shirts, all one word, and, um, and you can order these, and by ordering, you're providing them for all the new people that are going to show up next week and the new people that have been in the past couple of months. And so um, just make sure you do that um, sometime this week. And then um, if you were here on time, you saw a video, um, a promotional video, I Am New Heights Church, and that's going to be on our social media this week. Um, it's a cool way to invite, and so we've got, we're trying to make several ways for you guys to invite people this Easter season. We got, you know, the, the real hip shirts, we got um, the New Heights Collective CDs that are coming out, New Heights Collective is dropping a brand new single on, when's that happening, Nick Friday, I think, um, is it Friday the 30th? Okay, so that brand new single, Because He Lives, is going to be on iTunes and Spotify, and there's going to be a video, and y'all can share that. You can share the promo video. you got invite cards. you got a palm branch if you want to invite somebody somehow with that. So there is no excuse for you to not bring someone with you next week, and so we're praying that uh, the 500 of us at New Heights, that we, everyone brings someone, and we'll hit that 1,000. And so um, let me read the text today, and then, um, and then we will pray, and we'll jump into... Uh, the sermon today. Romans 12, we'll start at verse 14 and go through the end. It says, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If, if, if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Lord God, thank you for your word. Um, I pray that you would use me as a broken man um, to speak and teach this morning. I pray that you would allow me to bring insight to the text. But, but God, I pray primarily that your um, living word would speak to all of us. God, as we read this text, um, I, I'm humbled by it, and, and I'm implored to love the lost around me. And so I pray that that would be the heart cry of every individual in here. God, anyone who does not know you, I pray that they would be led to the cross today. Um, Jesus, as we worship you and praise you, I pray that your Holy Spirit would accomplish things in the hearts of people in this room and at our other two campuses right now. And Lord, that you would use this time to draw sinners to, to become saints and that you would sanctify your children. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so last week, um, if you were here, we looked at... Um, seven things in, in the passage right before this one. And so we had basically like seven characteristics that marked how we were to treat one another within the church. And so this week, um, we're going to not deal with how we treat one another in the church. We're going to deal with how we treat one another in the world. And so we're really looking at how we um, treat people who are not believers because this text leads right out with blessing those who persecute you. So it is not exactly the same as what we talked about last week, but what you're going to see is the seven things. Paul kind of follows this outline. There are seven familiar things, and they're very similar. Um, if you take notes or if you remember last week's sermon, they're very similar to the things we talked about last week, but they're going to be a little bit different when we're talking about how to deal with non-believers. And so if you're here and you're not a Christian, um, I I promise you, as you think about how you've been treated by the church, you're not going to see this in perfection. Uh, maybe you've seen it happen this morning. Maybe it hasn't been modeled to you well this morning. But um, nevertheless, this is what the saints are supposed to be striving to show you. And so I would implore you to consider becoming a Christian today. And then if you are a Christian, this is what we're inviting you into this week. As we tell you to go to people who don't know Jesus and invite them and love on them and, and share the gospel with them, we are inviting you into exactly what this text is talking about. So the first thing we see is blessing. 
The first thing last week was love, and, and what we see first this week is blessing. And so loving the lost is similar to loving the saints, but it is a little bit different, okay? There's love involved in both of them, but it's like a, it's like a less intrusive love, right? Um, so if, if, you, if you could tell someone who doesn't know Jesus, I want to bless you, um, it's a little more welcomed than if you go up to them and say, I want to love you. Right? That's, that's creepy to most people, especially if they don't have the love of Jesus in their heart. And so verse 14 um, says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. And so furthermore, the call of blessing goes to even enemies of the church. And so we're not just called to bless people who um, don't know Jesus, but they're kind of friendly toward the church. We're called to bless those who are enemies of the church. And, and let me take a second to just make this clear to you. If you are not wholeheartedly all in following Jesus, the Bible makes it clear that you are an enemy of the church. Now, I want to say that with as much love as possible because it may not feel like you're an enemy of the church. It may not feel like you have hindered the, the, the growth and the building up of the local church. But if you have not repented of your sin and put your trust in Jesus and lived for him, then the Bible describes you as an enemy of the gospel. And so what we see in Scripture is that there's no riding the fence. Like, you can't, you can't sit down on the fence with one leg on either side when it comes to Christianity. You're either all in or you're all out. And so what the Bible tells us who are all in to do is to bless those who are all out. We're to bless them. We're to love on them. We're to do things for them. And we need not retaliate toward them. He says, bless and do not curse them. So we're, we don't need to retaliate with curses and hatred toward anyone, even if they are enemies of the gospel. Okay? Um, and this is, this is difficult for us to do, right? Um, it's like when you're in traffic. Uh, most of y'all want to yell F you, but, but the Bible's telling you to yell bless you, right? You're supposed to bless everyone, and, and that's, that's counterintuitive, right? It's just wholeheartedly different than the way that we typically live our lives, or at least the way our nature wants us to live. And so blessing, what happens is blessing is not just saying something, it's doing something as well. It's practical. It's using all of your senses, all of yourself, your whole heart being actively in a, in a situation of blessing some people. And so I want you to ask yourself, how can you practically serve people who need Jesus? How can you practically serve them? Matthew 5, 16, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so your good works of blessing others should bring glory to your Father in heaven. It should bring glory to God. And so as you are doing things to bless other people, it will stand as a testimony for the people to see Jesus through you. Amen? Point number two is empathy. Empathy. So we see that we're supposed to bless people, and we also see that we're supposed to be empathetic. Verse 15, Paul continues, Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Now, um, in the church, we're told to abhor what is evil and cling to what is good, um, which leads us to corrective action, which leads us to lovingly telling people when they're being knuckleheads and not following the will of God. In the world, though, we're told to have empathy. And I always looked at verse 15, and it does apply to the church, that we're supposed to rejoice with people in the church who are rejoicing, and we're supposed to weep with people in the church who are weeping. But specifically, keep in mind the context of this passage. Paul, in the very verse before it, speak, is speaking of enemies of the church. And as he's speaking of enemies of the church, he continues on and says, Rejoice with them when they're rejoicing and weep with them when they're weeping. And just as, as, a, as a Christian, as I grew up in, in, the, in the church and, and as a pastor, I never really looked at verse 15 as describing a relationship outside of the church. But we are to have empathy toward those people. And that means rejoicing with enemies of the gospel when they, um, when they have, have common grace that's given to them and weeping with them when they are hurting this, this leads to a world where the church is empathetic toward them. And, and we're quick to not do that, aren't we? We're quick to make everything political. We're quick to try to fix everyone's problems. And you can see this in, like, when someone uses the hashtag Black Lives Matter or when we see school shootings or when we see teachers on strike, everyone wants to jump and they want to give solutions rather than hurting with people who are hurting. And the Bible clearly tells us that your job is not to tell hurting people how to fix problems. Your job is to hurt with them. It's to hurt alongside them. You see, a healthy dose of empathy will change the way that you interact with people, and it will boost your witness. I promise you it will. One of the most powerful verses in Scripture, John 11, verse 35. Your favorite memory verse, by the way. Jesus wept. John eleven thirty-five. 35. Jesus wept. If you, if you stink at memorizing Scripture, you can memorize this verse, right? Jesus wept. 
The verse in the Bible with the fewest words gives the greatest display of empathy. What's happening in the context here is that Jesus is going on his way to, to a home that is grieving. They've just lost their brother and friend, Lazarus. And as he's going to Lazarus' house, as he's walking in to meet the family of Lazarus, they're saying, Lord, he has died. He's been in the grave for four days. And if you would have been here, maybe you could have healed him. But now it's too late and he's dead. Now, what's amazing about this is Jesus knows the solution to the problem. What's the solution? Jesus is going to say, Lazarus, get up, get out of the grave. And he's going to come out all mummy-like with his grave clothes on. He's going to say, unwrap him and let him free. Jesus knows exactly what he's going to do, but yet when he's coming into the city to raise Lazarus from the dead, he doesn't tell him, hey, quit crying, quit bawling all over the place, quit being sad about everything, because I'm going to take care of it. He doesn't give them the solution. He weeps with them. And the solution comes later, but he is empathetic in the meantime. And so the verse of the Bible with the fewest words gives the greatest display of empathy, and our empathy should be similar it should consist of few words and deep emotion. There's a, today's Palm Sunday, there's a great song called Hosanna um, that we've sung here several times before. But one of the lyrics in the song says, break our hearts for what breaks yours. And, and let me tell you that when people who are enemies of the gospel, who don't know Jesus, are hurting, it breaks God's hearts and it should break ours as well. That they are hurting without hope. Isn't that sad? It should bring this deep emotion to us that there are people who are grieving, who are hurting, and they have no understanding of the solution. It should bring us to a point where we grieve alongside them. One Quaker, um, you know, I love Quakers, not just the Oats, but the the, the theologians as well. (laughs) George Fox was was one of those old school Quaker guys, you know, with the funny get up. And and he, he used to journal a lot when he was praying and stuff. And one of the things that he wrote in his journals Back in yesteryear, he wrote this. He said, I prayed to God that he would baptize my heart into all conditions so I might be able to enter the needs and conditions of all. Isn't that sobering? That this man was praying. God, he didn't say, send me through the predicaments of everyone in the world, but he said, send my heart through it. Baptize my heart into what they're feeling. This is the same sentiment that Paul has when he writes in 1 Corinthians 9, um, in verse 22, he says, To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. This doesn't mean you're doing the same thing as all people, but it means that you are being empathetic toward all people. And so you're going to go out this week as missionaries, and you're going to encounter people that don't want to come to church. And it's going to require you to be empathetic toward them. It's going to require you to think the way they think and feel the way they feel and and understand what they are living like and know what it's like to be in their shoes. So you're going to have to do that. And building upon empathy, leading naturally, I think, into the third thing we see is harmony. So empathy into harmony. Verse 16a, the first half of verse 16 tells us to live in harmony with one another. Again, just crushes my presuppositions because this is talking about our relationship with the world. It says that we are to live in harmony with one another. And the reality is if we can practice verse 15, if we can rejoice with people who rejoice and weep with those who weep, then we can live out verse 16 easily. That will put us in harmony with other people. And so harmony comes when we're empathetic toward people. I thought about bringing Nick up here and he and I were going to sing harmony um, as a sermon illustration. Um, but that would be embarrassing, and y'all would get your phones out and video me singing, so we're not going to do that. Um, But I thought about it, so it played out in my head, right? And as it's playing out in my head, I thought about how difficult it is to sing harmony. I don't know if any of y'all have, like, singing ability. Y'all are all in the choir of New Heights, so you sounded great this morning. Thanks for being in our choir. You're welcome for not making you wear a robe. Um, But um, what what harmony is, is, is singing something different without being at odds with each other. Does that make sense? Like, like singing harmony means someone is singing the main melody of the song, right? They're singing, death was arrested, and, and, then, and then someone else is singing, death was arrested, but in a little bit different melody, but not in a way that's altogether different that just totally crashes the song. So you're singing something different, but it is not at odds with the main melody. That's really difficult to do. I've tried it a few times, and my musical ability just immediately takes my brain to the melody because it's what I've heard on the radio and stuff and I would just immediately sing the main melody of the song 
Here's, here's how that applies to us, is when we show compassion, love, and honor to people, we are living in harmony with the world while not being of the world. You see the difference there? Because you're not just agreeing with what people do. You're not just agreeing with the sin of people's lives, but you are in harmony with people and you're showing them the love. And so, um, you know, let me just blow your mind for a second. You know you can disagree with people and still be civil? Right? You, can hang, you can go have a meal with someone and disagree with their political philosophy. I know, y'all are like blown away right now. You know, and the reason why that takes us back is because West Virginians specifically, I think, are typically known for what we're against rather than what we're for. And sometimes the church is the same way. Amen? I think all of us who's been in the church at any length of time could say that there are times that we've experienced people looking upon the church and knowing what the church is against rather than knowing what the church is for, which is the gospel of Jesus. And so if that's you, if you're here, and, and, and you've spent your whole life knowing what the church is against in your life, and you've never really heard it explained what the church is for, I, let, me, let me, on behalf of the church, let me apologize for that. I'm sorry for that. We, we should be promoting what we are for. We should be singing this beautiful harmony. We're singing, listen, we're harmony in an unbelieving world does not mean a condonement of all worldviews. What it means is that we are singing a song altogether different than the world. But sung in the right way will draw people into this melody. Just like I can't help but sing the mainline melody, sinners cannot help but see the beauty of the main melody of the gospel. And when you live that with your life and you don't just refuse to sing with them, but you sing alongside them and you live life with them and you do things with them and you work with them and you play with them and you have them over for dinner while singing the gospel song to them, they can't help but begin to try to sing that same song. It is irresistible to them as the Spirit works in their hearts. So harmony has gospel implications in the Imago Dei. No one is unimportant. You cannot look at anyone in society and say, they don't matter. You can't look at their, 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 their W-2s at how much money they make and say, they don't matter. You can't look at the color of their skin and say, they don't matter. You can't look at where they come from and say, they don't matter. There's no one in this room that doesn't matter. And we're called to be in harmony with you. The fourth thing we see is humility. Humility. Verse 16b tells us Christians and, and toward toward the world, remember, do not be haughty or or maybe like we would describe that as being holier than thou, but associate with the lowly and never be wise in your own sight. So whereas brothers and sisters need to see our passion, the world needs to see our humility. Sometimes our zeal that's talked about that we talked about last week and our passion sometimes can be viewed by non believers as like a holier than thou kind of attitude. And so we need to practice humility. And humility leaves profound impacts on people who need the gospel because it models the humility of Jesus. Amen. When we, when we model humility, we're modeling something Jesus modeled. The Bible tells us to associate with the lowly. Jesus was the best at this, right? He associates with you. Do you view yourself as the lowly? Because I promise you, when Jesus was on his throne, before he was born of a virgin... Before the first Christmas, as Jesus was high and lifted up, as Isaiah saw him and his train filled the temple, and Isaiah stands in his presence and he falls on his face and he says, Woe is me, for I am a man who is unclean. He's getting ready to die just for being in the presence of Jesus. And I promise you, before Jesus came to earth and he looked down upon the people on earth, the people who had lived on earth, and you who would eventually come upon this earth, he looked upon you and there was nothing within you that said, made Jesus say, yeah, I want to go hang out with them. I want to be buddies with that guy. There's nothing about you that made you attractive to Jesus. He viewed you as lowly. He saw your righteousness as filthy rags, but yet he emptied himself. He came and associated with the lowly, and that includes you. Philippians 2 verse 3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, and have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who though, listen church, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself 
by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so you've got palm branches in your seat representing when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on the very first Palm Sunday. Patrick was leading us in our volunteer prayer this morning, and he was talking about how um, just the historical aspect of what it meant for a king to ride into his city. And as Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, he fulfilled prophecy from Zechariah that said he was going to ride in on a, on a donkey. And he sent a very powerful message to us by the way that he entered the city where he would be murdered. He didn't come in on a horse. He didn't come in on this white stallion. He didn't come in in prestige and power. He came in at eye level with the people as he's riding on that road. And as you walked in this morning, you walked across these palm branches. I want you to just kind of imagine what it would have been like to be on that road, riding to Jerusalem. And as he's riding on that donkey, he is coming in in humility and in peace. He's coming in not in a time of war, but in a time of peace. And they were going to nail him to a cross. But listen, when he returns, he's going to return high and lifted up. Amen. And we're going to wave these palm branches before him. And we're going to worship him like never before. And so ask yourself, do you model what Jesus modeled to us? When you approach people, are you high and lifted up about your faith? Or are you humble in the reality that, yes, you are a saint, but only because Jesus took a jacked up sinner and changed your heart? You know what you are? You are a beggar showing other beggars where they can find bread. By grace, you have found the source of bread, and you, as a beggar who has now been welcomed to the table, now you can tell other people about this table. And so that doesn't lead to pride, it leads to humility, and it leads to peace. Number five. Number five is peace, that as Jesus came in like a time of peace, we are also to be people of peace. We're not to be a hostile people. Unfortunately, Christians are often notorious for being the most ferocious Facebook arguing crowd, right? That's us. That's who, that's who we're known to be sometimes. Now listen, I, I, I understand we need not be completely passive about everything. There is a time that we should take a stand, but the Bible is very clear that we are to be a people of peace. We should be wise in our disputes and always seek peace, and Paul gives us some insight here about seeking peace. He says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Notice he says, if possible. I know some of y'all just thought of somebody, right? <laughs> You're like, eh, there's that one cat, Will. He is impossible to be, live peaceably with. I get it. But he says, if possible, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So Christian, listen to me. You don't need to get even with anyone because Jesus didn't see fit to get even with you. And when you rightfully view yourself as an enemy of God, then you'll rightfully view others and how you're going to deal with other enemies of the gospel. Because when Jesus, the Bible tells us that Jesus looked upon us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us, church. We, we are in no way deserving of the grace. And, and then what we see in this text, is I think the most important phrase in that section of Scripture is give thought. Do you give thought to your actions? Do you give thought to your words? Do you give thoughts to the things that you're doing? Um, my boy Judah, um, he, was, he was getting ready to go the other morning, getting ready to go to school. And um, all our kids dress themselves. That's just one of the things we do in our family, trying to teach them independence so they can move out sooner. And um, <laughs> so they all dress themselves. And sometimes they come in like ready for school and they look like crisscross. Y'all know them? They got the, you know, your back, po- back jean pockets in the front and all that, and we're ju- we just roll with it. We're like, all right, cool. You're, you're decent. You're covered up. Go to school. Judah comes in the other morning r- totally ready for school, he says. He's got, he's got a shirt on. His hair looks nice. He's, he's got, um, like, great kicks on, socks, but he's just standing in his underwear. <laughs> There's no pants to be seen anywhere. Like, and I'm like, Judah, you're not ready to go. And, and he just stares at me. And I'm like, Judah, are you ready to go? And he says, uh, yes. And I'm like, no, you're not. You can't go to school without pants on. Right? So 
he gave absolutely no thought to what he was doing. He was just kind of going through the motions. You guys are like that, right? You go through the motions of your morning routine, and while you may put pants on, congratulations for that, you may go through the motions when you go and get coffee, you may go through the motions at your lunch, you may go through the motions at your job, and you're not noticing your surroundings and the fact that Jesus has given you every opportunity to give him glory right where you are. Amen. And you just go through the motions, you don't give any thought to the peace that you're supposed to be making. You see, Jesus, again, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And so some of you may look at your life and you're like, I'm a pretty peaceful person. And I would challenge you with this. Are you a peacekeeper or a peacemaker? Because Jesus doesn't say blessed are the peacekeepers. He says blessed are the peacemakers. Because you might not get in a lot of fights. You may be a, a pretty peaceful person and that people don't hate your guts. But are you making peace with the person that you work with that has inner turmoil? who's going through a um, really rocky place in their marriage, whose kids are rebelling, who are, th that person may be dealing with, with anxiety and depression, things you know nothing about. Have you been on the offensive with them and said, hey, I'm praying for you. Is there anything I can help you pray about? Hey, I'd like to invite you to my church family, invite you to my small group. Are you being on the offensive? Are you being a peacemaker? Because there may be no peace in their life. And you're not just called to not fight with them, Right? You're called to make peace with them, to be an ambassador for the gospel, to bring peace into their lives. Sixthly, we see benevolence is mentioned. Now, financial support is one of the things we talked about last week and how we should be generous people in giving financially and also of our resources and time. Um, but we can also use giving as an avenue for the gospel furtherance. Okay, Verse 20 says, To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. So this is why we feed enemies of the gospel. This is what benevolence is. This is why we help them. This is why we pay bills for people. This is why we do this, is so it can give us an avenue, not just so we can say, hey, we fed somebody this month, or so we can say, hey, we paid some electric bills this month. We do this so that we can tell people about the great grace that God has available for them. It models the benevolent love shown to us by God. And it says that by doing so, we will heap burning coals on his head. I remember like growing up in church and thinking like, yeah, I want to get back at you. I'm going to be nice to you because it's going to make you more mad. That's what the Bible tells me to do. <laughs> like, so the Bible isn't telling you this, this burning coals thing, so that like, here's the secret to really tick people off. <laughs> like, be, be nice to them. That's going to make them, make them real mad. This is an ancient sign of repentance, albeit weird, um, but this was, a, this was an ancient, an archaic way of showing repentance. You would get this pot, and you would, you would fill it with burning coals. You put it, on a, put it on a stove, get it like really, really hot, and then you would just put it on your head, and you would walk up to whoever you had wronged, and you'd be like, bro, I'm sorry, please forgive me. You'd probably say it as quick as you could so you could take the pot of burning coals off your head. And, um, and what it was doing, it was showing a way that I was, I'm willing to go through pain to make this right with you. And so that's what Paul's referencing here. And so what he's referencing is not making people miserable. That's not why you show benevolence. You show benevolence so that you can bring people to repentance. So they have wronged their God, and by feeding the hungry, and by giving drink to the thirsty, you can heap, you're like, hey, you need to repent so bad, I'm going to put the burning coals in the pot for you, okay? And you hurry up and shimmy down to the Lord and meet him at the cross and repent of your sin. It brings repentance to people. And number seven is kindness. Verse 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Right? In a world filled with animosity, you are to be kind. You are to overcome evil, not with a greater, stronger evil, but you're to overcome evil with goodness, with kindness. You know, we're celebrating Palm Sunday, and Jesus, in a display of the ultimate kindness, willingly rode into Jerusalem knowing that the road that led to Jerusalem was the road that led to his cross. Knowing that he would be murdered, that he would suffer, that he would be persecuted and tortured in the worst imaginable way. Knowing that he would die to save us. And he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed and it says that his sweat became drops of blood in a process scientifically known as hemidrosis, that he prayed and he was under such intense stress and anxiety that his sweat, he was literally bleeding through his pores at the task that lay before him. But yet he still chose to get on that donkey and take the road to the cross. 
And here's the reason you guys got those palm branches. I want you to get them up in the air real quick. Those palm branches, get them up in the air. Just so I just want to see them. Praise God. The people who would murder Jesus waved these at him. And he saw, he saw this. Look around. This is what he saw. He saw this, which was a sign of royalty being waved toward him, a sign of the king. Now you can put them down and put them on the floor in front of you for now. And what they did, just as you came into church this morning, what they did was they would lay them on the road in front of that donkey he was riding on. And that was a way of just making the path easy, kind of putting this padding on the path that as he took the road to the cross, that they were going to make it as easy for him as possible. But see, they had no idea of, of the cross at that point. And there are people that you'll encounter this week who have no idea of the cross. They might have no intention of meeting Jesus next Sunday. But I want you to take this palm branch home. I want you to put it in your car or put it, put it on your dining room table or something like that. And I want you to let it serve as a reminder to you this week that you are going to make the road to the cross easy for as many people as you can next week. That people are going to be walking aimlessly and you're going to show them the way. And you're going to, you're going to lovingly approach them to not just be a peacekeeper with them, you're going to be a peace, peacemaker with them. You're going to show them love and you're going to reach into a life that is just filled with things you have no idea about. The sins and the pains and the struggles that they go through. And you are going to make peace with them. And you're also going to realize you can't save them. You can't make that decision for them but you can make that road as easy as possible. And so I want you to pray. Bow your heads, and we're going to pray today for whoever you feel you may le- need to lead to the cross this morning. It may be yourself first. Maybe you need to take the path to the cross this morning. Luke, I'm so thankful for you, brother. He made this public profession of faith and baptism this morning. And this didn't save him this morning, but we got to publicly celebrate his salvation. The fact that He wanted to go public and identify with Jesus being buried and being raised. And some of you, you need need to come to the cross before you can invite anyone else. You need to experience it for yourself. And so if that's you, would you just pray in your own way? Just go ahead and start right now. Just ask Jesus to forgive you, repent of your sin. Thinking of the fact that he died for you and rose from the dead that we're going to celebrate on Good Friday and on Easter. And let's take a minute... Let's bow our heads. Some some people may be giving their life to Jesus now, and I praise God for you if you are. If you are a believer, would you just pray along with me as we pray for people that we need to lay some palm branches down for this week as we make the path to the cross easy for them?